Let's pray before we look at the reading from Psalm 51 together. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Lord, we pray that as we consider your word now, you would take your spirit and he would apply his word to our hearts and spirits, that we would be moved in our love and our faith and our trust in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we start a, a new six-part series going through some prayers of the Bible. We're going to be considering for six weeks prayer, because prayer is vital and important for a Christian. As breathing is to human life, so is prayer to a Christian life. But prayer is difficult. It's really hard to pray. In fact, Jesus' own disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend six weeks having God teach us to pray from his word. We're going to look at two prayers from King David, two prayers from the Apostle Paul, and two prayers from Jesus himself. And it's my prayer, as we look at these prayers over the next six weeks, we won't just learn how to pray, but considering these prayers, we will be moved to prayer. And so this morning, the first prayer we're looking at is Psalm 51. Perhaps one of the most famous prayers in the Bibles, actually. Certainly one of David's most famous prayers. It is a prayer of repentance. David prays this prayer after one of the most infamous moments in the Bible. We learn about the context of this psalm in the superscription, the bit just above verse 1. If you've got a Bible near you, do grab it open at Psalm 51, and and you'll see, as Ted thankfully, helpfully read, the little bit of detail above verse 1, which is also part of the scriptures. And there it says, for the director of music, Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. It's a pretty famous incident. It takes place in 2 Samuel, chapters 11 to 12. And remember, by this point, David is king. He's king over all Israel. And we're told at the beginning of the chapter, this takes place at the time when the kings would go to war. And David is in his palace, and he's looking out from his palace, and he sees a beautiful woman, Bathsheba, bathing. And he takes her for himself. And he commits adultery with her. But unfortunately for David, Bathsheba becomes pregnant and his sin is going to become public. So he needs to come up with a way of of covering what he's just done. So uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is currently nobly out fighting David's war for him. So David calls Uriah back. He he, He says, look, you're doing so well. Have some respite from the battle. Come and stay with your wife, sleep with your wife hoping that, of course, if they sleep together, they'll think that Uriah has got Bathsheba pregnant and David's sin will be covered. But Uriah is more honourable than David imagines because Uriah says, my Lord, by no means will I do such a thing whilst all my fellow men are fighting in the war. There's no way I could do such a thing. So he doesn't sleep with his wife. David's drat. Plan B. So he contacts Joab, who is his his general in his army, and he says, when you go to battle against the enemy, take Uriah and put him in the most fierce part of the battle so that he's surrounded. And when that happens, tell the rest of the troops to retreat. And that's what he does. And Uriah is killed. So, So David arranges for Uriah to die, and then he takes Bathsheba as his own wife, covering his sin. But the Lord knows. God knows what David has done. Uh, And so God sends a prophet, Nathan, to David. And Nathan comes to David, declaring God's message to him, and he tells David a story. He says, David, there once was a man, a rich man, and he had loads of sheep. He had sheep more than you could number. And a friend of his came to visit and stay. 
And this rich man who had so many sheep, he had a neighbour, a poor neighbour, who owned nothing but one lamb. And the rich man took the poor neighbour's lamb and he killed that lamb to give food to his friend to eat, who came to stay. Nathan says to David, what should happen to that man? David says, that man must die. For what he's done, that man deserves death. Nathan turns to David and says, David, you are that man. And by his own admission, David had condemned himself. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. David is moved to grief and regret and repentance and he writes Psalm 51. He prays Psalm 51. It is his prayer of repentance over his sin, this psalm. And in it, we see four traits of what it means to pray as someone who is repentant. Four traits of a repentant prayer. And it's my hope that as we look through this Psalm 51 this morning, we will see these traits and we would embody them ourselves. So what's the first trait that we see in Psalm 51 of a repentant prayer? Well, the first thing we see in verses 1 to 2 is that a repentant prayer pleads. A repentant prayer pleads. Let me read verses 1 to 2 again. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me, from my sin. See, David knows, given all that he's done with Bathsheba, with Uriah, David has nothing to claim. He, 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 he stands and pleads before the Lord. He has no claim for the favour that he begs from him. I don't know if you noticed in those first three verses, the word my is used five times by David. Blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David knows, as it were, his head is on the block. The guillotine is about to fall and there is nothing David can do. And he pleads. He pleads mercy. David knows he has no power and God has all the power. I wonder if you've ever prayed like that before. If you've pleaded with God like that, where the desperation of your situation has so dawned upon you that you give up bargaining or demanding or presuming from God and you just plead, Lord, have mercy. It's the first trait of a repentant prayer, they plead, having nothing to offer themselves. The second trait of a repentant prayer is in verses 3 to 6, and a repentant prayer knows, let me read verses 3 to 6 again, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David knows and grasps the depths of his sin. Sin is a funny word nowadays, isn't it? If we hear the word sin, we often, probably the thing that jumps to mind most of all is probably chocolate. I had too many chocolates, had one too many chocolates. I, I ate a curly whirly last night. I sinned. In fact, it's definitely the case that that's what our, our mind would jump to in society. So I don't know if you're aware of Weight Watchers, but Weight Watchers ha uses the terminology of sins. If, if you... If you uh, they're, they're sort of a way of measuring calories sort of thing. So you might look at this meal and say, well, this meal's got three sins in it. That's sort of our culture's understanding of the word. But it's very removed from the Bible's understanding of the term. See, in the Bible, the term sin means, well, it's our settled rebellion against God. It's not just the things we do, like, well, like David did, adultery and, and murder and lying. It's more our attitude of living the whole of our lives as if we were the king of the universe. And God wasn't. And David knows his sin. It's the kind of sin, sin is really the, 
It's, it's the madness that drove humanity to, to kill God when he came to earth to shine his light into our lives. It is an insanity. Sin takes us away from God's light into darkness. Sin takes us away from God's love into disconnection. It takes us away from God's life into death. David, as a repentant prayer, knows the depths of his sin. And for David, sin isn't something that's out there in the world. I don't know if you ever heard this phrase. Um, my wife said this to me once, you know, um, you're driving somewhere and there's loads of traffic and you're stuck in a traffic jam and you can't get somewhere on time and you ring up and you say, I'm sorry I'm late, I'm in traffic. As if there's you and everyone else around you is the traffic. And it's good to say, no, no, I'm not in traffic, I am the traffic. And that's often how it can be with sin. We can look out in the world and say, there's all this stuff going on. But a repentant prayer knows that ultimately where the sin resides is here. In my heart, David knows that. Perhaps you know the, the author G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton was a, was a Catholic author who wrote a number of stories. He wrote the Father Brown novels, if you know those, and he wrote a number of books. And at one time when he was alive, the Times wrote a piece. They said, uh, what is wrong with the world? And they encouraged different people to read uh, and to write in with what they assumed was, was the trouble, the biggest problem in the world. And different people around the country would write in and say, this is the problem, or, or this is it, or if this was solved, then that would solve this problem and things. And G.K. Chesterton wrote in just two words. What is wrong with the world? He said, I am. Profound understanding of someone who knows something, sin's not just out there, but it's in here. And David knows this. In fact, David knows that despite all David has done, God remains the most offended at, at David's sin. Look at verse 4. This is weird. Verse 4. David writes to God, Against you, you only have I sinned. And you kind of read that and you go, Wait a second, David. You sinned against Bathsheba. <laughs> you sinned against Uriah. You sinned against Joab. You sinned against pretty much the entire kingdom. There's no one, David, you, you kind of haven't sinned against. And yet David writes here, Lord, against you only have I sinned. Because David knows above all the rest, God is always most offended at our sin. So a repentant prayer pleads, a repentant prayer knows the depth of their sin. But thirdly, the third trait, a repentant prayer also is confident. A repentant prayer is confident. Look at verse 7 with me. David writes, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It's kind of like a bolt from the blue, that verse. Amongst David's repentance and fear over his sin, suddenly he's got this great confidence, no half measures, utter confidence, God, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Of course, in the, the, the Middle East, where this is sort of uh, originating from, snow was sort of the thing that you would imagine to be the whitest, the purest thing you can imagine. When I spent six months in Senegal, in West Africa, working with Christian missionaries, they were doing a translation of the Bible into the local dialect, and they were working out how to translate this verse, Psalm 51, verse 7. Because, of course, Senegal is sort of, well, it's, it's halfway between uh, the equator and the Sahara Desert. In other words, it's really hot. And they never get snow. And so there's no experience for lots of people living in the villages of what snow really is. And so they decided to translate it. They were a little bit artistic with their license. And they said, wash me and I shall be whiter than a sheep. <laughs> Which I thought was a lovely translation for a people that have a rural economy and they've got sheep. And it works fantastically well until you go outside the door and you look at all these mangy sheep that are all dirty and filthy, and you think, well, it's not such a fantastic picture after all, which isn't so different from here. I mean, sheep aren't always necessarily the whitest things imaginable, are they? But you get the idea. David's got this utter confidence. 
that God will make him whiter than white, squeaky clean, no matter all he's done. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It's not a confidence he's got in himself. It's a confidence that he's got in God that despite his sin, God will show mercy. The question is, where does David's confidence come from? Where does he get that from? There's a clue. There is a clue in verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Now, hyssop is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Exodus chapter 12, the Passover. Moses said, take a lamb, kill the lamb, get a branch with a hyssop from a hyssop plant, and get the blood of the lamb and paint it on your door frames at Passover. David says, wash me, cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. David knows he can never be clean on his own terms. He knows that there must be a substitute, there must be a lamb that dies in his place who will cleanse him so he can be whiter than white. Of course, we know, don't we, looking back from the New Testament, that there is a lamb. Animals are never able to make us whiter than white. But the death of the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, who cleanses us, that's where we become whiter than white. David is pointing forwards to David's greater son, Jesus. So a repentant prayer prays with confidence because they know ultimately Jesus will certainly provide forgiveness. It's the third trait. There's a fourth and final trait here to end with of a repentant prayer, and that is the repentant prayer David shows us is transformed. Verses 13 onwards. Let me read verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. David, the great sinner, wants to be used by God to reach other sinners to receive God's grace and forgiveness. After all, who better to call back and speak of God's mercy than someone that's received it themselves? Previous church that I worked at, we had quite a large gathering um, of Alcoholics Anonymous met in the church and occasionally I'll go along and meet with people and without a doubt the people that were in that group who did the best for others helping them along moving them forwards lifting their heads back up when they stumbled the best people by a country mile were people who'd previously been alcoholics themselves it's just true isn't it The people who've gone through something are able to help those going through it. And David knows, well, David knows he's a great sinner. (laughs) He committed adultery. He committed murder. I mean, he's right up there, King David. But God took him and he transformed him around through his repentance. And he transformed him into someone who would transform others. God loves doing that. He loves taking the broken and using them to minister to the broken. St. Peter and St. Paul's church, couldn't pick better people for that, could you? St. Peter denied Jesus, rejected Jesus, sobbed his heart out. Jesus turned him around, became the rock of the early church. St. Paul, persecutor of the church, came to a place of repentance and was transformed, became someone who planted the most churches in the early church and wrote much of the New Testament. Repentant prayers are used powerfully by God to minister to others. Four traits of a repentant prayer. Someone who pleads, Lord, on your mercy alone, nothing do I have to bring. Someone who knows the depths of their sin. Someone who's confident in the mercy and forgiveness of God that will be given through Jesus, someone who's transformed to live, bringing that good news to others. So a question to end with for us all as we begin this series in prayer, 
How much repentance is in your prayers? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this psalm, for this prayer of repentance. Thank you for the life of King David, that you transformed him and brought him around through the prophet Nathan coming to him to that place of repentance. Lord, do the same in our lives. We'll be, we be those who don't look out in the world and say, gosh, what a place. But we look in on ourselves and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or will we plead with you? Will we know the depth of our sin? Will we be confident the forgiveness you offer in Jesus and transform us by your spirit to live the truth of that forgiveness out in the world to others. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.